speak on nothing. All right? The love of God. But here is something I have noticed. That is, that love to be effective is a two-way street. Now here's what I mean by that. For instance, years ago, there was a father who loved his son, one put him through college. And so he worked hard. He was a farm man out in the hills. He worked hard to get some money to put the son through college because he'd not gotten an education himself. And so as time wore on, uh, he decided he'd pitch the rig up and go over and visit his son, see how he's doing. So he went over there and drove right on the campus, poorly dressed. He'd been giving all his money to the boy. And uh, when he got there, who should be coming along down the sidewalk but his son and some of the other fellows. And they were laughing and carrying on. And the old fellow stopped and uh, spoke to his son and said, Hello, son. And the boy stopped, and he, of course he was with worldly, ungodly companions. And he turned and looked at them and said, I don't even know who he is, and walked on. And the old man was so heartbroken that he went home and crawled into bed and died, the story says. He just died of a broken heart. Now, what was it all about? It was a one-way street that the son didn't return, and it hurt the father. Don't you realize, friends, that God loves us? But if we don't return God's love, it's going to hurt him. Have you ever thought about that? That if we don't return the love that God has showed upon, showered upon us, it's going to hurt the Heavenly Father's heart. Now, we quoted John 3.16 once. Let's try it again. Everybody together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is there anything magic about the phrase John 3.16, just that phrase? Now, you know, men put those notations in there. Those weren't in the original. John 3.16, we just quoted it. Now, I wish that everybody would please quote along with me another John 3.16, only this one is 1 John 3.16. Now, all of you who know that verse, will you please quote it out loud with me? Here we go. Hereby precede we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren now what happened I was quoting a John 3 16 wasn't I well let's try it again now everybody get a quote with me now hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren well I heard a voice or two let's all turn to it maybe that'd be a good idea you know we ought to do something different once in a while so we're going to do something different right now Everybody turn to 1 John 3.16. And uh, if anybody has trouble in finding it, that is on page 298. Well, how about that? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, you know what I'm doing, don't you? I'm kind of twitting you a little bit. If you don't have the books of the Bible memorized, that's what I'm doing and I, I just want to make it plain you see that I'm just twitting you a little bit and so I gave you what well, it probably isn't that page number in yours oh it is well that's fine <laughs> all right first John 3 16 let's all read it out loud now and get your specs on if you need to and get them adjusted here we go everybody read it with me hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Oh, God loved us, and we can return our love to God by laying down our lives for each other. You know, I've said enough already tonight. If I were to sit down, it would give every one of us something to think about, wouldn't it? Because love is not a one-way street. And too long people have thought of love as being a one-way street. Husbands need to love their wives, and wives need to love their husbands, and it's a two-way street. Parents need to love their children, and the children need to love their parents. It's a two-way street. I need to love you, and you need to love me. See, it's a two-way street. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, amen? Huh? What did you say, Brother Clark? <laughs> all right well anyhow there's a lot in the scriptures about this matter of love did you ever try to define love well there's two words in the original Greek language 
One is phileo, and we get our English word Philadelphia from that, the city of brotherly love. There's brotherly love, and then there's a divine love type of thing, like God loves, or like the mother loves, or, or so on. Uh, now, a brotherly love is to manifest some act or token of affection, to kiss, to have affection toward. And we get our word kiss from that word phileo, and so on, to cherish highly. But there's another word, and that's the word which is always used when it's talking about the love of God or a mother's love for a child or something like that. That's agapao, and that means uh, to love or value, to esteem, to delight in, or to attach a value to it. Now let me explain it by this illustration. We say, here's this little baby that's born, and the mother cuddles that, and I never will forget, when our first one was born, I came there into the room, and here my wife had that little girl cuddled up to her. She loved that baby, see? Now, what had that baby ever done for us? Not a thing. That baby had never spoken to us. It had never showed any acts of kindness. That baby hadn't done anything for us, had it? Except to breathe and eat. <laughs> done that much for us. But we loved that baby. Why? Because we saw in that child what could develop into an adult, what could have its home, and we attached a value to that child. There was love. And love is built on respect. Now I'll tell you something. When young people do not court each other on a basis of respect, they'll kill love before it ever gets started. A husband needs to respect his wife, and a wife needs to respect her husband. And when they do things that would kill that respect, they've automatically started to undermine the very basis of love. Love is built on a lot of things. Let me give you the definitions again to delight in, to attach value to, to esteem it, uh, to have a generous concern for it, to be faithful toward it, or to set a great store or value upon it. To value it very highly uh, is the word in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Now we said last evening uh, that we got to thinking about this matter that uh, where James said, I will show you my faith by my works. And I said, hold it. There surely are some Bible verses here, and I just happened to think of a couple, you see, and then I began to run the references on the word love, and I came up with, I think, are some very helpful Bible references. How can love be shown? Well, we might turn to the 13th chapter of John, and Jesus said in this verse that love needs to be a demonstrated sort of a thing. I could gather that thought, you see, from, first, uh, from the second chapter of James, but I think this comes as close as anything to saying it here. And in John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye should love one another, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Now, it's not that we have our collar on backwards, or that we have a funny little hat on our head, or, or that we wear shoes with buttons or some other sort of a thing that people have tried to use down through the years as a mark of some kind that they were Christians. But Jesus said, this is the badge that you are to wear, that you have love one for another. And how is the world going to know much about Christianity if the Christians don't love each other? But they said in the early days of Christianity, the sinners said of the Christians, Behold how they love one another. Now, that's not a Bible verse. That was a statement of some of the heathen back in the days of early Christianity. Behold how they love one another. And this is an important subject. It is important enough to spend one night in a little bitty short two week of meetings on it. Because this is the very basis of our obedience to the Lord. And so let's turn to the 14th chapter of John and verse 15, we're almost there, just a page over probably, John 14, 15, and here is what Jesus said. If ye love me, keep my, what? My commandments. Now look, friend, this is one way that love is shown. Here are the commandments of Christ, right here in the New Testament. And if a person is not interested in the commandments of Christ, how can they claim that they love God? They couldn't make it stick, could they? At least they might with me or you or somebody else, but they surely couldn't make it stick with God, that if they love God and ignore his commandments, surely there wouldn't be any uh, real love there. But you see, love is the foundation of obedience. 
Well, turn again to 1 Corinthians 16, and here is a statement. And we're just going to have quite a lot of Bible verses tonight and not a lot of comment on these verses. 1 John, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, which you like men be strong. Let all your things be done with charity, literally, love. That was the 1611 word, charity, but our word nowadays is the word love, so wherever you find charity, uh, in the King James, realize that it's talking about the same thing that we mean when we use the word love nowadays, and it's this word, agapao, which I've used a moment ago, uh, the strong word. And that's the word I'm following here. I've checked all this in the original to make sure I'm using the right word everywhere uh, in these Bible references. Well, again, turn to 1 John 2, the first chapter, I mean the second chapter of 1 John. And the book of 1 John has much to say about the love of God and our love for each other and our love for God. 1 John 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him, by the way. Did you know that there's a parallel theme in the book of 1 John? One of them is the love of God, and the other one is liars. And you will find more about the love of God in these four, five short chapters, and any other five chapters, or any other book. And you will find more about liars in the book of 1 John than you will in any other five chapters. And if you don't believe me, check up on it and read it through and mark them all in your Bible. You'll find that, that there's a double theme in this book. And I'll tell you, you no, know, because there's a lot of people say, oh, I love God. Sure, I love God. But here's what it says in verse 4, and this is Bible. You know, sometimes people get awful excited and say, that's buckles. And I have to come back and say, that's not buckles, that's Bible. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. A lot of people will say, oh, that's just the preacher's idea. That's just his notion. Look, what does the Bible say? It isn't what Buckle says. It's what the Bible says that it really counts. Amen? Say it a little louder than that. Amen. Amen. That's right. That, that's what counts is what the book says. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. See, it comes out in the open. So he that keeps the word of God, he that practices the scriptures, people are going to catch on to the fact that that person loves God. Love is being demonstrated by his obedience. Well, we must hasten on. We can't spend any more time on that particular point. But we turn to another and turn to the second chapter of Philippians. And beloved, here is one that is really need to be preached in the average congregation in this day and age. In this day and age of, of uh, uh, schisms uh, and uh, splits and diversity of ideas and uh, churches splitting and uh, uh, all the carryings on that is going on nowadays, these verses really need to be emphasized. Philippians 2 and verse 2 says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Now see, there's unity. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And I'll tell you why it is it's hard to have unity around some folks is because love is so thin. Where love is strong, where love is genuine, where love is active, you will find it easy for those Christians to get along with each other. See, because they love God, and in loving God, they love each other. Well, it's like this. If here's a man over here, and he loves God, and here's a man over here, and he loves God. Say, if these, if A and B both love God, shouldn't they be able to find it quite easy to love each other? I wanted that one to soak in. I just wanted that one to soak in. Real good. Like I heard a preacher say one time, I hope this sermon digests. <laughs> you know, it isn't what you eat sometimes, it's what you absorb from what you eat that does the good in you, that you get strength from. Just eating a lot is what you eat. So I just pray that this sermon tonight on the love of God really digests and becomes a very part and parcel of your soul. Love unites. And how can you convince somebody that you love God if you are at outs with your Christian brother or sister? 
How can you convince God? How can you convince others of the love of God? So it says here, uh, have the same love and be of one mind. Well, let's take another verse. Colossians, the second chapter, we find a very similar thought over here, even stronger maybe in one respect. Colossians 2 and verse 2. And this is quite interesting. Both these books, it's 2-2. Two, two. Colossians 2-2, two, two, it says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father of Christ. Uh, you see, their hearts being knit together in love. Now this is the kind of phraseology that a nurse or a doctor would understand about bones mending. You see, the bone is broken, and so you get the two pieces up together, and they grow back together. And the expression is the bones knit themselves back together. In other words, uh, the fibers were intertwined uh, so that they perhaps were as strong as they ever were before. They were knit together or they grew together. Now you see, this is the way God would have the Christians to be. He would have our hearts and our lives and our very activity knit together in his cause. And love is the thing that's going to make that possible. You see, where people don't love each other, they can't work together. Now that's just an absolute statement of fact. And the Bible bears that very thing out. Well, it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 18, that Paul and Timothy were united in their work. They had the same spirit and same mind. And how did they? Because they both loved God. And we could show you Bible verses like that, but we don't have time. Uh, so we'll pass on to number three. Turn to, uh, well, we've quoted John 3, 16, so let's just uh, shorten the thought up a little bit here. Turn to 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Now, we've quoted this matter about God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son. I'll tell you something about love. Wherever you find real, genuine love, you will find gifts. Now, I've not always had very much money to get my wife a gift. And I never will forget when we were first married, and some churches where I've preached in days gone by uh, weren't the most liberal in their support for the ministry. <laughs> and it came time for one of those days, you know, when you had better remember, uh, let's see, 1492 and 1776 and your wife's birthday. You better not forget any one of those three. <laughs> well, you ladies know what I mean? How many of you ladies know what I mean, Steve? <laughs> All right. <laughs> You know what I mean, don't you? And so it came one of those days, you see, and I just didn't have any money. And you know what I did? I stopped in at a nearby store and I bought my wife a remembrance in a brown bag and I took it to her. And she appreciated that. Why? Because it was a gift that was backed up by love even though there was no money to speak of involved. Still, it was a gift that expressed something. The child comes running in, and in the spring, you see, there's one of those first dandelions. And the child has picked that thing and says, Oh, Mama, I got a flower for you. And the Mama says, Thank you, see. Now, what's behind a thing like that? That child loves its mother. And where there's love, there is always gifts. Now you just analyze this. When a husband quits giving little things. Oh, I found a card in the store here the other day that was just the right one. A nice card. Not one of these filthy things, but a good card. And I mailed that to my wife today. And we're always doing those little things, you see, for each other. We have quite a time. You know, I'll tell you something. I'm still courting my wife. Did you know that? After 40 years, I'm still courting her. And she just eats it up. Now, don't tell her so. <laughs> she just eats it up. <laughs> and you men, now you ladies don't need to listen now, but you men take a word to the wise of sufficiency. <laughs> uh, well, here's what I'm getting at. If I use some kind of I homely illustrations, maybe you can remember the Bible verses I'm trying to use, see? Where there's love, there's gifts. Yes, indeed there is. 
2 Corinthians 8. And what does it say there in 2 Corinthians 8, 5? And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Now there was some giving there, you see, involved on the part of those Corinthians. So let us go on down to verse 8. All right. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Isn't that something? Here is the proof of love. They gave. And it's just like I just said, wherever you find love, you will always find gifts. Just mark it down. This is one way that love is demonstrated. This is one way that love is shown. Where there's love, there's gifts. Again, take a look at verse 24, the same chapter. Wherefore show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. See, he's talking about their giving because just forget now that chapter 9 is there. And read right on down now from verse 24 right into the next chapter. And I tell you, a lot of people miss things because they stop reading at the chapter. And so, like I mentioned the other night, I want to emphasize this. Sometime when you read your Bible through, read halfway through one chapter and stop, and then read halfway in the next chapter and stop, and you pick up some thoughts you missed. And so verse 24 goes right on down into the uh, next chapter for his ministering, uh, touching the ministering to the saints. He's still talking about the same subject. Actually, an old paragraph there. Men have put these chapter headings and verses there for the convenience of finding these things and for the convenience of reference. And we get down to verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give. See, it's still the same thing. And that's still, you might say, a part of the thought in chapter 8, that the proof of love is the giving. Now that's quite a thought when you get a hold of that, isn't it? That where there's love, there's gifts. Oh, I tell you, I, I don't have time to, to go into the details I'd like to tonight. But I just thought of another one here that uh, I, better, I better not pass this one up. Where are we here? I want that reference back in the Old Testament, and I wonder if I've got it written down here. Um, yes. Uh, here was Jacob. Jacob, you know, pulled a fast one. And what did he steal? What? He stole what? His brother's birthright. Well, that was kind of sneaky of him, wasn't it? <laughs> and his mother cooperated. See, she put the skins on his hands, you know, and fixed him all up, you see, and fixed up the nice meat. And, uh, we'll put one over Papa, we'll fix Papa, and we'll give you the birthright. So Jacob stole his brother's birthright. Well, don't worry about it. It happens. The same thing you put out, you're going to get paid back. Because the Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the God of heaven sees that it works that way. You put it out and you'll get it back. And Luke 6, 6 38 says the same thing. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For with the same measure that you meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. That's what it says in Luke 6, 38. Well, let's see now. Here's Jacob. Wow, look at her. Ah, oh, that's the one for me. What have I got to do to get her? Got to work seven years. Mm. So he worked seven years, and who'd he get? Oh, he got, he got her sister, didn't he? Well, that wasn't too good. Well, what have I got to do to get the one I want? Worked seven more years. Turn to Genesis 29. I was looking for the reference. See, I knew I had it written down here somewhere. Uh, Genesis 29. I want you to notice that now. Uh, where there's love, uh, there's service, there's giving. And it's unbegrudging, too where there's love. And so in Genesis 29 and verse 20, I want you to notice this. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. Isn't that some Bible verse? <laughs> wow. 
That is sure some Bible verse, isn't it, fellas? See, you ladies don't need to listen now. That's some Bible verse, isn't it, men? He worked another seven years for her, and it just seemed like a few days because of the love he had for her. That's quite a Bible verse, isn't it? But you see, that's the way it is where there's love. Where there's genuine love, there is always gifts. Well, Jesus gave himself, it says in John 15, 13. And that's, that's some Bible verse too, John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Do you know who had the greatest love on this earth? Well, sure you know it was Jesus, wasn't it? Why, the Apostle Paul and Peter and others, they've had great love. There have been people who have been very unselfish and very uh, self-degrading and very loving and kind and full of service. But I want you to know that the greatest love that anybody ever had upon this earth was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who so loved the world that he gave his Son. And where there's love, there's gifts. Well, we hasten on to number four. Love causes a person to work for God. Oh, say, we've got some real red-hot verses here tonight on this subject. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 1. I'll tell you when you get a hold of these Bible verses, it'll give you something to think about and something to work on for a while. And uh, I'm preaching this sermon tonight because I realize that this is one thing. I'll tell you, the Church of Christ people can holler about baptism until they're hoarse. But I want you to know that the love of God needs to go along with it too. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verses 2 and 3. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Well, look at that, would you? I tell you, the love goes right along with the work. And say, where there isn't any love or where love is thin, you're going to have a hard time to get people to work for Jesus. I tell you, you'll just have to beg and you have to coax and you have to twist their arms and you'll have to wheedle and you'll have to do all sorts of things to try and squeeze a drop of service out where somebody does not love the Lord. But where love is strong, there's going to be a lot of work for Jesus. Well, turn to Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Here's another one. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. There's a strictly a topical message tonight, although we could have developed this from 1 John 4, because the word love occurs real rapidly in 1 John 4. Anyhow, Hebrews 6 and verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So look at it there. Your work and labor of love. You see, there you have work and love all in one package. And that's the reason why that some people will work so tirelessly for Christ and so unselfishly for Christ and give of self so abundantly for Christ. It's because their love is strong for Christ. Where love is strong, I'll tell you, you're going to find lots of labor in the kingdom. Turn to Hebrews 10, just a few pages over Hebrews 10 and to verse 24. And here's something. Now, if I consider you, if I am considered of you, on what basis should I be? Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. In other words, among all things I should be trying to do night after night is to stir up your love for Jesus so that you will work for Jesus. And when you love Jesus, you'll work for Jesus. That's right. Absolutely that's right. This is one way that love is shown, is that we are willing to work for the Lord who loves us. Well, we just hasten on. Turn to 1 Peter 4. Now, here's one they misunderstand sometimes. And it doesn't quite mean what some people think it means. And I'm just going to poke a, a pin in that bubble uh, right now, right quick. 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. And here's what it says. And above all things have fervent love or charity among yourselves for love or charity shall cover the multitude of sins and some people say well if you love me you'll ignore my sins you look the other way and you will say nothing about my sins 
Well, you see, it's like this. If I love you, you see, I'm supposed to never mention your sins. Because of my love for you, I just can't bear to mention your sins. Now, that's not what this verse means. I'll tell you what this verse really means. And that is, when love is strong, sin will be dealt with and people will quit their sins where the love of God functions. That's exactly what it's talking about. When you love God, you want to get rid of your sins. And you want to help other people get rid of, your, of their sins. And you teach in such a way that they can get a victory over sin. Where the love of God is strong. Why did I teach my wife after we got married like I did? I was telling you the other evening. Because of my love for her, that's why. I loved her. And so I kept on teaching until she got to see some of these things from the Word of God. And so where there's love... It's going to cover a multitude of sins. Now look at here. Do you know what happens when you love somebody? I'll tell you what happens. When you find somebody being beat on and you love them, you'll try to help that person that's being misused. I've seen that over and over again. And so where Christians love each other, if somebody's attacking that Christian unnecessarily, the person that loves them is going to try and strengthen them. You see, love covers a multitude of sins by doing it the right way. Love doesn't ignore sin. God so loved the world. Do you mean to tell me that God ignores sin? How many folks think that God ignores sin? Well, of course not. God is not in the business of ignoring sin, and yet God loves us, and so we should be God-like. We should not ignore sin. We should want to see people repent, and our love for them will tenderly uh, urge them to repent and serve God. You see, the love of God is going to accomplish a lot of things when it is active. Love is not something that we can polish off, you see. Uh, just suppose that this box here represents love, you see. And here's how a lot of people look at this business of love, you see. Uh, God wants to get this out once a week on the first day of the week and dust it off, you know. Well, washing dishes, mending the fence, putting on the roof, name it. Anything we're doing, you see, working on the car, talking to our neighbors, the love of God is to permeate our very beings all the time. Now, here's where these folks that talk against the kennel, you see, they say, why, the, that's an awful sin. But you know what? When we're teaching on something like this here tonight, can't you readily see that a Christian loves God all the time? Not just in the church building. Why, you love God at home, you love God everywhere. A Christian worships God all the time. I saw a church sign here a while back outside of one of these buildings where they won't have this, you see, and it said something like this. Uh, Bible study, 10 o'clock, worship, 11 a.m. And I've asked those people, is Bible study worship yes or no? And oh, oh, they hate to answer that because they know they've got to say yes because Bible study is worship. You see, if you're really studying the Bible, you're worshiping God. And if you aren't worshiping God when you're studying the Bible, then you're doing something wrong somewhere. And oh, they hate to admit that. And so I've said to them, all right, now let's see now. If you're going to put a sign out there, why don't you do this? Uh, put down there, Bible study 10 a.m. and love 11 a.m. How'd that be? How'd that be to have a church sign out in front that says Bible study 10 a.m. and love 11 a.m.? You know what somebody would say when they look at that sign? They'd scratch their head and say, I wonder if that's the only time they ever love each other is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, that'd be some kind of a church, wouldn't it? Only time they ever love each other is when they're there in the church building. And then, boy, they'll skin each other the rest of the time. And they'll run each other down the rest of the time. And they'll criticize each other. And they'll gossip about each other. And they'll knife each other. But 11 o'clock on Sunday, you see, their sign says love, 11 a.m., so they're going to love each other then, you see, because that's what their sign says. Now, now, can you see what I'm driving at? How many folks caught on what I was driving at? Well, what about the rest of them? <laughs> I tried to make it plain. I'm not ridiculing anybody. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you to see that God so loved the world, and hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How can we do that? I'm just giving you several ways tonight that we can lay down our lives for the brethren. Ways in which we can demonstrate the love of God. How else will the world ever learn of the love of God if we don't demonstrate it as Christians, I'd like to know. Will they? Why, 
Uh, no, of course not. All you can shake your head yes or no or amen or any sign you like. Uh, that's just fine. Well, anyhow, love covers a multitude of sins. You see, love is a dynamic force to get men to quit their sins. And I dare say that this is probably one of the things, one of the reasons why that some people have not gotten hold of this matter of quitting their sins is because the love of God is lacking somewhere. Well, let's take another one here. Uh, Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Love adds steadfastness. Now, I didn't say stuckfastness. I said steadfastness. You see, the trouble of it is some people are stuck fast and the others are steadfast. And there's quite a bit of difference between the two. So here in uh, Ephesians 3, we want to notice this. If the third chapter of Ephesians. Pages won't turn right here. Ephesians 3, verses 17 and 18. Here's what it says. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Here is the flywheel. Here is the thing that gives stability to a Christian. And that is that they are rooted and grounded in love. And the Christian who is rooted in love is not going to be blown around with every wind of doctrine, are they? because there's going to be some stability to them. I know in the Old Testament, uh, when Jacob would make mention of his 12 sons, he made a little speech. And he said of Reuben that he was as unstable as water. And what a statement, that Reuben was as unstable as water. You know, water is unstable in every form. If it's liquid, it's evaporating. And if it's evaporating, it's turning back into dew. And if it's liquid, it's freezing. And if it's freezing, it's drying. Water is unstable in every form. And so he said of Reuben, he is as unstable as water. You know, a lot of people are blow hot, blow cold, off again, on again, chasing after a doctrine, here, there, gone, and go, uh, gone again, on again, Finnegan, so on, that type of thing. And you see, it's like this. God wants stability in Christians. And so it says so right here in Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, and depth, and height. You know, Einstein thought he really did something when he came out with the theory of relativity. But you know what? There's the four dimensions right there in verse 18. Now, how do you like that? I wonder if Einstein knew that verse 18 was there in that chapter. Well, I don't know whether he did or not, but there it is. Uh, the breadth and length and depth and height. There they are, right there, all four of them. The four dimensions right there. And it doesn't make any difference which direction you go, friend, or which direction I go. If we are rooted and grounded in love, we are going to be stable in Christ. We'll be dependable. We will be trustworthy. We will be busily engaged for Christ because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. That's what it says in another place. Oh, I tell you, there's so many Bible verses on love. I don't have time tonight to pick them all, but I've just tried to give you a few here uh, along this line. Love is foundational to obedience in the first place, we said. And the second place, love unites. In the third place, where there's love, there's gifts. In the fourth place, love causes a person to work for God. In the fifth place, love covers, causes sin to be covered in the right way. In the sixth place, love causes steadfastness. These are ways in which love is demonstrated. I didn't say can be. I said these are the ways in which love is demonstrated. Now we want to turn it around the other way. You know, last Saturday evening we talked on this matter of the sin of prayerlessness. In other words, this is the opposite of prayer. And so now, what Bible verses show a lack of love? Turn to John 5, 42, and this is Jesus speaking. This is not buckles, this is Bible, here in John 5 and verse 42. Now, you get the complete picture, you're going to have to read verses 38 through 44. 
and we won't take time to read those. Our time is so very limited. So we're going to start here with John 5, and in verse 42, these words. Jesus said, But I know you that you have not the love of God in you. Now, I probably wouldn't dare to walk up to a person and say, I know that you don't love God. Because I might do more harm than good if I said that. It might not be so. A preacher friend of mine, a fellow made a very curious remark about him. And this preacher said very kindly, he said, just because you say so doesn't make it so. He said, they said that Jesus had a devil, but that didn't make it so just because they said so. So you might, somebody might say unkindly things about me, but that wouldn't make it so just because they say so. Jesus said, I know you that you have not the love of God in you. Now why? God loves the truth. And if you read verses 38 through 44 or 45, you will find out, Jesus said in verse 40, and ye will not come to me that you may have life, and he says that uh, I, I receive uh, not the honor of men. He says in verse 43, I'm coming to my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Now isn't that something? Some of these religionists nowadays that come along uh, with a new religion of some kind, they can get a bigger following than all the preachers put together here in the United States. I've seen something like that just lately. We've got the flower girls, and we've got the unification church. We've got a lot of things going on nowadays. And they're boasting more followers than all the churches put together. Why? Well, Jesus said, if another comes in his name, him you will receive. And so if he promises something big, uh, he's a, a big wonderful. Uh, people just flock after him. Real, real something special. Jesus said, I know you that you have not the love of God in you. And so here it is. If we are quicker to follow men than we are Christ, that shows a lack of love. People are interested a lot of times what the preacher says. No, it isn't a question of what I say. It isn't a question of what Brother Schwarzkopf says, you see. What does the book say? What does God say? That's the important thing, isn't it? That's right. That's the important thing. What does God say? What does the book say? And so... When men do not care for the truth as it is in Christ, that shows a lack of love. Well, it says the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2.10. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, that they received not the love of the, of the Lord, that they might be saved, or the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Well, let's hasten on. Turn to the 13th chapter of Romans. Romans 13. And here is another Bible verse that is very worthy of our deep consideration. Romans 13. Now, we talked a while ago about how that love will cause Christians to be united at heart. And love will bind people together. In other words, when people find out they have differences and there's real genuine love, they're going to work at it to see what can be done to alleviate or dissipate those differences where there's real genuine love. Instead of magnifying those differences, they will see what can be done to relieve or put them out of the way. Romans 13, verse 10. Here's what it says. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. What a wonderful Bible verse. You know, any person who spreads dissension, any person who gossips, any person who magnifies and broods over misunderstandings. And I'll tell you something, the Bible says it's impossible sometimes what those things come. But look, what do you do when you misunderstand? Did you read in between the lines? Did you say, no, you know, I'll tell you. It was the tone of voice that preacher used. I just know he's after my neck. That preacher, I just know he's after my neck because I could tell from the tone of voice he used that he had it in for me. And so, you know, people brood over things and they brood over things and, and the first thing, you know, after they brood over the thing a while, it gets bigger and they blow it up out of proportion. And this Bible verse says that love works no ill to his neighbor. 
and certainly more so to the body of Christ. So to magnify and brood over the misunderstandings that some people have, some person might have about you. One woman said, that woman was talking about me. And so they said, well, how do you know? Well, she was clear across the street. And she said, I could just tell by the way her mouth moved over there that she was talking about me. Probably wasn't talking about her at all. One fellow said, did you know that they're talking about you? I said, yeah. But I said, I'll tell you, I'm going to try and live as best I can so they have something good to talk about. Well, that's the only thing you can do. Did you know that people talk about you? How many of you folks knew that people talk about you? Well, certainly they do. And so I'll tell you what to do. Give them something good to talk about. Amen? That's all I know to do, see? Give them something good to talk about. Live for Christ. Uh, be forgiving. Say, I'm sorry. It's probably my fault. And I tell you, when it comes to husbands and wives sometimes, they don't like to admit that it was their fault. It was you. It was you. Well, let's try another one. Turn to 1 John 2. What shows a lack of love? And here is one that is really something in the day and age in which we live. This one is very prevalent nowadays, and this one is a love destroyer. That's what this thing is. 1 John 2 and verse 15, and here is what it says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, you can't love God and worldliness at the same time. Well, somebody says, what does that word world mean? Well, it does not mean the birds, bats, bees, bugs, and butterflies. It's simply talking about God. That's what it's talking about. Not the birds, bats, bees, bugs, and butterflies, or something rather like that. Uh, so here in this Bible verse, it says, love not the world. In other words, it's talking about a carnal consideration uh, for carnal things. Now, what draws the hardest on some people? I'll tell you what draws the hardest on them, and that is amusements. And that's the reason why a lot of churches nowadays have gone to having singing quartets and, and singing choruses and, and all sorts of things. And even up here in Iowa, I see they're going to have some magic performances now. Well, I'll tell you, I used to, I was on the stage at one time doing magic uh, performances. I performed a half an hour sometimes in front of farm bureau meetings, put on magic tricks, make a handkerchief lay eggs. That'd be kind of popular when eggs go up, wouldn't it? And uh, all that sort of thing. And uh, well, you see, uh, but you know what? You can't hardly do magic tricks without lying. Because you stand up there and move your hand around and say, now see, the hand is quicker than the eye. Well, of course, that's a lie because the hand is not quicker than the eye. But you get them to watching something else while you're doing it, and it's done either before or afterwards, you see. And, and so they, they don't even see what you're doing, and, and you're just doing such innocent things, you know. That they don't think that when your hand is moving that way, that's when the thing is actually done. But that's it, you see. And so they can't even fall. say, well, how'd that happen? Well, you see, you lied to them. That's what you did. And behind a lot of magic tricks are lies. And so I'll tell you, some time back, I swore off of that kind of a thing. I decided I was not going to perform any more magic tricks. That was a great plenty for me after a few incidents that I'd told Brother Schwarzkopf about, <laughs> which I will not tell you about tonight. Worldliness. Well, what do you think about? How do you spend your time thinking? What do you think about? What do you like to read? Now, there's been quite a few papers put out back here from time to time. And uh, we're not trying to be facetious when we name the one that we publish out there at Salem, Good Reading. I had an article like this in the first of that when we first started publishing it, and I said, well, the reason we're calling it Good Reading is because there is so much bad reading. And because if people would read the Bible and things related to the Bible, then that would help them to do some good reading. And I have a rule that I follow as I edit this little paper, the good reading paper. I have a rule, and that's this. I republish articles that when you read them, you will feel like you've been preached at. And that's the rule I follow. 
I subscribe to papers myself. When I read that paper, I feel like I've been preached at when I read those articles. And if I don't feel like I've been preached at, the first thing you know, I don't subscribe to that paper anymore. I just forget to renew it when the time comes, if, even if it's a free one. I just forget it. And if they keep on sending it, I'd probably just throw it away. I don't pay any attention to it. I want to read material that is going to stir and challenge and strengthen my soul. I don't want any diluted junk of some kind. Well, there's a lot of worldliness in the world. And people can indulge in these worldly things. But I'll tell you something. I have observed several things. You know, I went to make a call. And when the door opened, I walked in. Lo and behold, there was a card game in progress. There they were, four women sitting around this table playing cards. And as I walked in, I had my Bible under my arm. Walked in. Well, have a seat. The lady of the house got up and said, have a seat. So I went over and sat down. And she went over and sat down in the chair. And that left three of the women sitting over at the card table with the cards. And so we visited for a while. And uh, just general things about uh, the church. And this woman, by the way, where the card game was in progress, was a regular attendant at services. And I didn't know she was a cardboard shuffler. So, pretty soon, I, one of the women at the table over there, she had the deck in her hand, she said, well, let's play a three-hand. Let's play three-handed. And so one of the other ladies said, uh, well, no. And so she kind of turned her chair around toward the two of us. And so that left the two of them there. And this woman sitting there uh, fiddling with this deck of cards, pretty soon she turned to the other woman, she said, uh, let's play two-handed. And the other woman said, well, uh, no. And uh, so uh, that left this woman sitting there, and I guess she would hadn't played solitaire if she'd played at all. She was left there with a deck of cards in her hand. What's she going to do? And so I thought, I'm going to find out something. And so I said to the three of them, I said, now I said, I have not mentioned playing cards today, have I? No, you haven't. And they looked kind of, no, you hadn't. Well, I said, now listen, tell me something. Why would the presence of a preacher spoil a card game? Will you tell me why that the presence of a preacher would spoil a card game? And the one of the women, not the lady of the house, one of the other women spoke up and said, well, she said, you know it's not right. And so you know that you hadn't ought to do it when a preacher's around. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that sanctifies the thing. I tell you, you know, we preachers are really wonderful, aren't we? Or are we? <laughs> well, isn't that something? Well, a preacher friend of mine, I was looking through his notebook. And he had all sorts of things in his notebook. And on one page, there was the ten spot of diamonds. And I said, what's that thing doing in your notebook? Well, he said, my sister, he said, belongs to one of the big Christian churches over here in Denver. And he said, she was writing, and she sent me her Easter bulletin, and was telling me what wonderful, glorious Easter services they'd had. And he said, you know, he said, when I opened her letter and opened it up, out dropped the ten spot of diamonds. She had inadvertently been playing cards on the table, you see, and when she had gathered up this bulletin and gathered up her letter and folded it all up and put it in the envelope and sent it to me, she sent me this ten spot of diamonds telling me how wonderful her Easter service was. So he put that in his notebook, you see, and pasted it in there as souvenir number A. You see, what are we getting at? Worldliness. What would you rather do? Would you rather study the Word of God? Or would you rather just shoot the breeze? Well, now you know some people like to shoot the breeze, whatever that is. I don't know how you would, bang! I don't know how you'd shoot the breeze, but I guess that's a, an expression, you see, of just yak. Yakety, yakety, yak, yak, yak. And a lot of words to no profit, but you know the book of Proverbs says something about that too, about a lot of words to no profit. Worldliness. No, I'll tell you, it says in Romans 14, let not then your good be evil spoken of. That's what it says. So would you do something that would cause some sinner to say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. And you know, we Christians need to watch out that we don't do something, you see, that would allow some sinner to say, if that's Christianity, deliver me. 
let not your good be evil spoken of. Well, take a look at another one here in 1 Corinthians 10. And you see there's a lot of principles laid down in the scriptures. They don't actually name anything. But you see, if you are filled with the love of God, you will try to find out whether or not what you are doing is contrary to God's love. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. And there's another one of those expressions, whatsoever you do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Say, listen, friends, if we really love God, if we really love the church, if we really love the Gentiles, look, we're not going to do anything to cause them to stumble or be offended, are we? What did you say? Amen, that's right. We're going to live in such a way to live above reproach. And you can. You can live above reproach. Certainly, the apostles did. Anybody can. But you see, where the love of God is thin, worldliness will be rampant in somebody's life. Well, again, turn over to Matthew. No, let's see. Turn over to Revelation 2. I expect our time is getting away. Revelation 2. I tried to hold myself within an hour tonight. doesn't seem like the time has gone that fast, but it has. Turn to Revelation, the second chapter. And here is a Bible verse that is full of thought. Revelation 2 and verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And what have these people done? They had turned against the Lord, because they had left their first love love the love of many else shall whack cold jesus said in matthew 24 12 and 13. when a person refuses to let god have his way or where there's only a partial obedience to the word love is lacking you know a lot of ways in which love is shown or the love lack of love is shown love is always expressed when a person says, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, but you can't get them to pray. What's the matter? Well, there must be some love lacking, because where you love, you will like to communicate. And, you know, we mentioned this the other evening about uh, this business of uh, the silent treatment. A woman giving her husband the silent treatment. Or I knew a case back in Minnesota of a man that gave his wife the silent treatment for two weeks. He would not talk to her for two weeks. Well, is it any wonder the thing ended up in a divorce? Or a split up or some kind of a thing, whatever it was. Fight, I guess it was, maybe. Love is expressed. 1 John 3.18 is a good Bible verse right along this line. Love is expressed. I tell you, uh, love is going to find a way to express itself uh, because uh, that's the very nature of love. And so 1 John 3 and verse 18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And it was Bible verses like that that sparked me on to think about this. What shows the presence of love and what shows the absence of love? Love is unchanging. Behold, I am the Lord, I change not, it says in Malachi 3, 6. And in uh, Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is love, we read here in 1 John 4. And greater love of the, the no man than this, we read of Jesus. So they both are unchanging. Love always identifies itself. Emmanuel means God with us. And when Christ came to this earth, he identified himself with us. He, de he identified himself with us. Let's turn to the 10th chapter of Mark. And here is something that I just must put in tonight, even though our time is gone. I went as fast as I could possibly go. I, I'd only spent as much time on each point as I thought would be necessary to try and enlarge it enough to where you'd be able to understand what we were trying to say. But there was a rich young ruler that came running to Jesus. And he said, uh, good master, he said, what should I do? Well, Jesus said, what do you call me good for? And so he enumerated some of the commandments. Well, the young man said, I've kept those, observed them from my youth. And in Mark 10 and verse 21, it says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, 
one thing thou lackest. You know, where there's love, there is always warnings. And so the child starts out of the house, look out how you cross the street. Careful now. Be sure you wear your rubbers. What's behind things like that? It's because that mother loves that child, that's why. And I want you to know that when a preacher really loves people, he is going to warn them. It isn't because I'm mad at people. It isn't because Brother Schwarzkopf is mad at people. Why we warn you of the things we do is because we love you. And on that basis, we warn. I was driving along the road in West Virginia. And I'll tell you, some of those roads are crooked. You can almost run into your taillight around some of those mountain curves. And, uh, oh, that's pretty crooked all right now. And uh, so here was a sign there that said, slide area, watch out for falling rocks. And the hills were low. And we were speeding along there. I didn't think there was any reason to be careful about falling rocks or slide area. And we came around the curve, and right out there in the very middle of my lane was a great big rock. That thing was as big around as that table. And he had stopped right out there in the middle of my lane. And it was a mountain curvous, curvaceous road. And I was going a little bit fast to hit that thing. And so I pulled out and went around it. I said, oh, I'm sure glad there wasn't a car coming around that curve. Because that could have been a little bit sticky about right now, see. I'll tell you, that too scary. And my wife and I said, and you see, there was about a half a dozen bull rocks about so big along with that thing. And we looked back at those hills, and we said to ourselves, where did that thing ever come from? It had been rolling, you see, from way up there somewhere, and it rolled down, down one hill, up another one, down another one, and it finally stopped right out there in the middle of my lane. Slide area. Watch out for falling rocks. Now let me ask you a question about the highway department. See, I don't know much about the highway department of West Virginia. I know more about the one out there in Oregon because I worked there for a while. But did the highway department of West Virginia put that sign out there, slide area, watch out for falling rocks because they were mad at me? Yes or no? And they were mad at those tourists. And those guys ought to stay home. Let them stay off the road. Is that the reason why they put that sign out there? I'll tell you why they put that sign out there. Because behind warnings is concern. And concern is one form of love, isn't it? And when a preacher stands up and warns people about worldliness, and warns people about sin, and warns people about turning down the invitation of Christ, and warns people about these things, you know why? It's because we love people, that's why. That's exactly why I warn. I warn you folks because I love you, that's why. And that's why Jesus warned, because he loved. He said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, and after that have more, no more they can do, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus loved and Jesus warned. A preacher was teaching on the life of Christ, and he thought, well, we'll make a category. And so he began to go through uh, all the statements of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and to put them in two categories, warnings and not warnings. And you know what he found? He told me this. He said, as I analyze the statements of Christ, he said, I found out that more than half of the statements that Jesus made were in the form of warnings. Now, isn't that something? More than half the things that Jesus said. I'll tell you something else too. As far as this matter of money and material things are concerned, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, never spoke of material things except in words of warning. Now the Bible does not condemn money. The Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil.